Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. It is 10 a.m. meaning that it is time once again to discuss the day's Hindu newspaper and see what are the most important news stories from the UPSC examination point of view. Also just reminding you, we have our own telegram channel where we have a quiz based on these topics that we discuss as soon as the session comes to an end. If you are still not part of that telegram channel, the link is in the description of the video. Please click on the link and become a part of it to revise whatever we have studied every single day. These are the topics that we have taken up for today's discussion. So from the mains examination point of view, we will be discussing first <clears throat> question of parliamentary conduct. This is a very interesting article written by Mr. Shashi Tharoor, who himself is a member of the parliament. He discusses what are the problems in parliamentary conduct in India and maybe some lessons that we can take from the British Parliament. Then there is an article written by the founder of Apollo chain of medical uh, hospitals and pharmacy. He talks about the issues that Indian healthcare sector is facing and the scope for development. Then we'll be discussing the status report on Project Cheetah now that it has completed one year. And then what are the government's views on regulatory mechanisms for the OTT? Then from the prelims examination point of view, we will be discussing about the PM Vishwakarma scheme recently launched, Dhanush guns that are again in the news, <clears throat> Shanti Niketan in West Bengal being formally inducted in UNESCO's World Heritage List and in the end we will be discussing how African nations Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso have come together and their military leaders have signed a mutual defence pact. Let's start with the very first article. The first article, as I told you, is written by our member of parliament, Mr. Shashi Tharoor. He talks here about the issue in parliamentary conduct in India. There are a couple of things that all of you are very well aware of. First, the fact that in the past few years or rather in the past few decades, there have been multiple disruption in our parliament. In fact, disruption in our parliament have become extremely, extremely common, which is extremely unfortunate. Late Arun Jaitley, the big BJP leader, he once said when he was in the opposition that disrupting the parliament is also a part of the strategy. But the problem is when you disrupt the parliament extremely often, you do not leave enough time for the speeches to go ahead. Then we also have one more fact that all of you are very well aware of. That is, our parliamentary model is based on the Westminster model of Britain. As you know, a lot of parts of our constitution have been derived from the practices followed in Britain. Our parliamentary form of government is one of those. So in this article, he gives certain examples of the practices that are followed in the British parliament and how can they be helpful in India as well. The author here says, if you look at how our parliament has been conducted in the past few years, and not just the parliament, even at the state legislature level, the level of debate, the proceedings, all of that has declined over the past years. For example, we have seen how frequently people are speaking out of turns. In the state legislatures, we have seen scenes where even furniture is thrown on each other, slippers are used to attack each other. Thankfully, these scenes are not seen at the parliament level, but at the state legislature level, all these things have become extremely common. In the parliament, he says that there was once pepper spray released by a protesting member of parliament, as a result of which multiple members of parliament had to be hospitalized. This begs a question. Are we setting the right example for the country? When the entire country is looking towards the parliament and the members of the parliament, can you actually exhibit this kind of a behavior? In most of these cases, the speaker or the presiding officer just ask the members to apologize or suspend them for a few days. However, this here is not the best way possible. Not just the disruptions. Shashi Tharu also says that if you look at the parliamentary committees, even those committees have not been working properly. For example, many important committees used to have opposition people as their leaders so that the opposition members could also discuss issues and could also get their voices heard. That practice has also changed. 
increasingly now a lot of parliamentary committees are being headed by the members from the government itself by the ministers only which also goes against the entire spirit now what are the examples from britain that we can follow first example he talks about opposition day <clears throat> in simple terms what is this so in britain there is a convention that on certain number of days the opposition party gets to decide the agenda of the day like in india every single day the government decides the agenda what do they want to discuss what bills do they want to be passed do they want a certain debate or not etc opposition does not really get to have a say in how the proceedings of the indian parliament will run in britain there are specific number of days termed as the opposition days on these days the opposition parties decide the agenda how many days will there be like this that really depends on the negotiations so there can be 20 days in a year 30 days 40 days depending upon the negotiating negotiating power between the opposition and the government second important example that he gives that we can take perhaps is something called prime minister's question time now there are a lot of very interesting videos of this on youtube and i would really suggest you to see those videos for 5 10 minutes it's a very interesting feature of their parliament as a name suggests the members of parliament mainly from the opposition can directly ask questions to the prime minister these are usually short questions and the prime minister would usually reply on the spot it makes up for very very good debate in uk in fact millions of people watch this live whenever they have the prime minister's question time it is usually the leader of the opposition that starts the questioning and then other members of the parliament can also chip in it's not very long it's usually about 30 minutes or so but it allows the people to know what the prime minister is thinking prime minister also gets a chance to resolve the queries that the opposition members have Shashi Tharoor says that in our parliament, the prime minister only comes in when he has to himself make a speech. But that should not be the way going forward. Then there are other reforms as well from the side of the speaker. Essentially, speaker in our country, although expected to be a neutral party, but most of the times would belong to the ruling party only. Obviously, when the speaker is elected from members among the Lok Sabha, and Lok Sabha has a majority of the ruling party. it is very obvious that the speaker would also belong to the ruling party only now this is where it gets interesting a lot of the times the speaker does not really abide by the principle of being impartial we have seen how the speaker's conduct is very different towards the opposition members as per the author the speaker also clubs proposed amendments to the bill in want to avoid speeches the speaker also rejects them by voice vote without any discussion and even the members of the opposition that want to raise questions are not given enough time so there is a need for reform from that place as well now while the author here talks about parliamentary disruption but does not give any data to prove his point so i am helping you with this data there are a number of reports which have pointed out how continuously we have seen the number of working hours of the parliament reduce for example as per the prs report 15th lok sabha that is 2009 to 14 so frequent disruptions lok sabha only had 61% of the working time and rajya sabha only 66% that number is just declining 16th lok sabha 2014 to 19 it was 37% of the time in the lok sabha that was lost and it was even worse as compared to the 14th lok sabha so every single lok sabha that we see is just declining in the quality of debate and the amount of time being given to the parliamentary business this graph also shows you the same how the percentage of productivity in rajya sabha and in lok sabha has been declining this is very different from the years when india became independent when the parliament was known to be the place where heat and debate actually is seen from all the opposition members against the government and the government also replying to that it also gave a chance to the citizens of the country to read the minds of the government and of the opposition now that case does not exist i also wanted to give you certain other 
examples of suggestions that you can quote going forward how to improve the working of our parliament. First, have a proper code of conduct. So Lok Sabha has a code of conduct for its members of parliament since 1952, but it is not abided well. We have seen a lot of members of the parliament being suspended, but usually that depends on the whims and fancies of the presiding officer rather than seeing who is abiding by the code or not. Second, increase the number of working days. See, the parliament in India, as you know, usually meets for three sessions in a year. We right now have a special session, but special sessions are very rare. So usually it's three sessions in a year. If you add them up, they usually make up, what, 75 to 80 days, not more than that. The suggestion is the parliament should meet for at least 110 days and the state assembly should also meet for 90 days at least. I'll tell you something very interesting. Because we focus so much on the parliament, we do not focus on the present condition of the state legislature. The reality is if you look at the state legislatures in India, their condition is extremely bad in terms of how many days do they actually have a meeting. For example, if you look at our state legislatures, most of them, do you know, have sessions of two days or three days. In the entire year, most state legislatures do not even meet for two weeks in the entire year. The problem is we don't really pay attention to that because our focus is mostly on the parliament. But at the state level, the situation is even worse. The committee suggested in 2001 that state legislatures should meet for at least 90 days. In UK, 100 days are set. Similarly, the case is in Canada, where they also have certain days reserved for the opposition agenda. We also have a proposal that was made in 2019, where deputy chairperson of Rajya Sabha got the idea of having something called Parliament Disruption Index to show to the public how much disruptions are happening in the parliament so that the common people can also judge the working of the opposition or of the government. Similarly, there was an idea of productivity meter to tell the people how productive the parliament has been so that they can adjudge the performance of their own members of the parliament. Next, we move on to the second article that is focused on healthcare system in India. It's written by the founder of Apollo Group, Apollo Group that has a large number of hospitals and pharmacies across the entire country. The idea of the article is very simple. India is not focusing on a big problem. And the problem is of non-communicable diseases. As the name suggests, communicable diseases are those that can be communicated from one person to the other, like COVID-19. It is human nature that when there is a disease that can spread from one person to the other, we get more scared about that because we are not really sure about how and why the disease will catch us. So we are more skeptical, we are more fearful, it makes a lot more news. But the reality is non-communicable diseases are even more dangerous and much larger in numbers that we tend to ignore. Non-communicable diseases, for example, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, even cancer, all these are non-communicable diseases. The author says that since we are not focusing on this, the burden of these diseases would be about $4 trillion by 2030. Now, when you say burden of a disease, that means two things. First, let's say there are 100 people who are ill. That means they are not working, they are not earning, so they are not contributing to our GDP or to our tax collection. So that is one cause that the government has to bear. If people are ill, they are not working, so our GDP is going down and income tax collection also is going down. On the other hand, when they are ill, a lot of them would want to take services of the government hospital so that they can get their treatment free of cost. That also is an added cost on the government exchequer. So on one hand, you are not doing your duty as citizens by contributing to the GDP. On the other hand, you are becoming an increasing burden on the government exchequer. That is how we have this burden calculated as $4 trillion. As per the author, this is a big, big roadblock to India's development and it creates its age tax. Again, age tax means that you have a situation where people are being a burden on the government without even realizing it 
and the other people who are healthy would have to basically pay for them. It's not to say that the situation has not improved. He says that 40 years ago when he launched Apollo and compare that situation to now, a lot of indicators have increased. Average life expectancy has increased by 30%. We have also seen infant mortality coming much, much under control. We have seen maternal mortality being improved, so on and so forth. Not just this, India has also become a center for a lot of different types of treatments and surgeries for patients around the world. We have people coming in from large countries in India to have affordable and great quality health care, especially for organ transplant, cardiology, oncology, etc. India has emerged as something called MBT. We discussed about this earlier as well, medical value tourism, medical value travel, sorry. It means India as a destination provides you a great quality of healthcare at a very minimal value, at a very minimal expense. And that is why we see people around the world coming to India. Not just this, India has also made a breakthrough with proton beam therapy technology, which is considered as the next big thing in cancer treatment. The good part is India is also using AI, especially for diagnosis. The best way to treat any disease is to know when the disease is going to occur. If you can prevent the disease, prevention is the best form of cure. But preventing a disease is not going to be that easy. It requires a lot of information. It requires a lot of scientific models that can predict if a certain disease is going to occur or not. And this is where AI, that is artificial intelligence, is playing a great role. Many startups in India are working in this field helping hospitals and healthcare professionals to track the health records of the patients and predict what kind of problems can occur in the future. The author says AI expenditure in India will reach about 11.78 billion by 2025 and it would be able to add $1 trillion to our economy by 2035. And if the government really wants this to be the shining light, they also should focus on increasing this expenditure going forward. Now, the non-communicable diseases have always been considered as a silent killer. Why? When you have a situation like COVID or things that spread from one person to the other communicable diseases, this is where it creates a form of fear, terror in the minds of the people. People lock themselves up. People don't interact with each other. We saw what happened with COVID. But when we have non-communicable diseases, we do not give them the kind of importance the kind of significance that this should. If you look at the numbers, they are staggering. Over 25 lakh deaths were caused in India due to cardiovascular diseases. Over 9 lakh due to cancer. Over 11 lakh due to chronic respiratory disease. Over or close to 3.5 lakh due to diabetes. You might say on one hand, since India's population is so huge, we'll always have these huge numbers. But even then, Lacks and lacks of people dying due to non-communicable diseases is a big cause of concern. Few months back, the WHO released a report. The report was titled Invisible Numbers, The True Extent of Non-Communicable Diseases and What to Do About Them. This was a report that focused on the problem of non-communicable diseases. It also laid emphasis on the issue in India. The report highlighted the problem of diabetes, cancer, and respiratory disease. It said that globally, and this data is extremely important, globally, one in three deaths in a year is due to cardiovascular diseases. Two-thirds of these people belong to the low and middle income countries because of the kind of consumption they have, the lack of quality health care they have, the lack of affordable health care that they have. And India also, unfortunately, lies in this bracket only. The only thing that can save us is better research, change in our habits, and adopting a healthier lifestyle. The next article is about Project Cheetah. I'm sure all of you have read multiple things about Project Cheetah. 
The government of India tried to reintroduce cheetahs in India by importing them from multiple nations. A total of 20 cheetahs from Africa. 20 African cheetahs were imported in total. Also, we had four new cubs born in India. However, this good news has been turned into a pretty, particularly depressing news because of a lot of deaths happening amongst these cheetahs. There is still a lot of debate over why and how these deaths have occurred. There are still people suggesting that maybe we have not been able to take advantage or take care of the cheetahs that we have introduced from a different type of an habitat. For example, Project Cheetah as we are discussing, it is aimed at establishing viable cheetah meta population in India. Cheetah, an animal that had been or that had uh, become lost in India because of a lot of hunting habits that our royal families used to have. The effort to reintroduce them was also an effort by India to reach out to multiple African nations. As I said, a total of 20 cheetahs were introduced in India. First, eight were introduced and then 12 others were introduced from South Africa later on. The first eight from Namibia and then we had 12 from South Africa. However, questions have been asked on this project because of the multiple cheetah deaths. Now, you don't have to remember how many deaths have occurred, but just remember multiple deaths have occurred amongst those cheetahs. For example, when we released them into the wild, we saw that many of them were not able to survive. Many of them were again held captive. Basically, again, they were put into cage so that they could only be openly freed when they are able to take care of themselves. Out of the four cubs that were born, three of them were also killed, three of them died. So basically, it is again a case of dwindling population. Right now, we have 14 adult cheetahs that are surviving and one cub that has survived. Now, there are multiple doubts raised over this idea. Even when the government had planned to bring in these cheetahs, there were many people who had raised questions whether they will be able to survive in this habitat. The African habitat is very different as compared to the condition where you are putting them in India. There was always a question of whether the project will be successful or not. Even right now, the government is not saying that the project is not successful. The government is saying that no, they are still working to make the project a success. All these sitas have again been caught by the government authorities. They are again held in captive so that they can be taken care of. They will be released once the weather improves, once the, once the winter sets in. Now, the big question is how and why did the cheetahs die? There are no definite answers to that. One cause that many people have been pointing towards is maybe because of the radio collars. So, just understand this. When cheetahs were introduced from Africa, all of them were put these collars here. These are radio callers to track their movement, to track where they are, to track whether they have some issues or not. Just in case they have to be caught again, you need to track them. Now, these radio callers, as per many wildlife conservationists, have been or may have been the cause of concern. Because there are many issues that have been pointed out because of these callers. For example, many people say that these callers are extremely tight, the cheetahs are not used to it. It might harm one of their very important organs that is around the neck itself. The nerves may also be damaged. Then the other side of the story is, maybe it's not the radio callers. Maybe there are certain insects or parasites in India, which these African cheetahs are not used to. The dead bodies of those cheetahs who have died Post-mortem has been conducted on all of them and there are multiple reasons that have come out. For example, one cheetah died due to renal condition means kidney related issue. Then we had a female cheetah that died when there was an attempt to ensure there is mating between male and the female cheetah. Four cubs that were newly born out of them, three of them died due to extreme heat wave condition. One of the male cheetahs died maybe due to cardiopulmonary failure. So again, there are various concerns that have come up. It's not fair to just point out towards the radio callers. 
there is one more thing that people are pointing towards. That is, ever since the government has introduced these cheetahs, they have been given the topmost priority. So a lot of government budget that was earlier divided into different programs for conservation of varied species, that budget has now all been focused on Project Cheetah. So it has a negative impact on a lot of other endangered species. Many other programs are now suffering from a financial crunch. For example, the Great Indian Buster Program, Translocation of Asiatic Lions, all of them are now suffering from lack of funding because the government's top focus has become survival of these cheetahs. Also, the cheetahs that were meant to save the grasslands and other natural ecosystems but the idea is they have not been able to assimilate into the food chain as smoothly as we had hoped. See, it, the reason primarily to include or to introduce any new species into the ecosystem is to make it a part of the food chain. Make sure that when they hunt certain prey, that also adds up to the food chain so that the important resources that we require for our survival are safeguarded. So we thought that we would be able to safeguard the grasslands when they are introduced into the ecosystem, but that has not been able to have so far. This has been considered as a faulty strategy, at least for now. A bit of detail about the radio callers, since these are at the center of attention ever since the cheetahs have started to lose their life. As I said, they are mainly used to track and monitor the animals, collect data about their behavior, where they are migrating, their population dynamics, etc. There are certain concerns related to it. As I said, first, wounds on the neck. There can be certain septic on the neck. How do you treat them? Problem with long-term collar usage. See, these wild animals are not used to any tight instrument that is connected to their neck. So it might cause some issue when they are running, when they are fighting, when they are engaging in any battle or trying to hunt their prey. Weight considerations. Now, ideally, the guidelines that have been given at the global level is radio collars weight should be below 3% of the animal body weight. Below 3%. The modern collars that are being used are about 400 grams, which are good enough for cheetahs between 20 to 60 kg. However, when you have younger cheetahs, which might not be at this weight level, for them, to now include or introduce these neck collars would not really be an easy task. We also have problem of lack of adaptation to monsoon conditions because in the monsoon conditions again, there may be certain irritation around the neck. The cheetahs might not really like what is around their neck. It might lead to irritation and this also has a negative impact going ahead. The next article from the mains examination point of view is about the government regulations for OTT. Now, before I go ahead, let me first clarify here, what does OTT mean? Usually, when you think of OTT, you think of Netflix, Amazon Prime, uh, Hotstar, not that. Here, OTT refers to your social media platforms. So here, OTT means WhatsApp, Signal, Meta, Google Meet, Zoom, etc. So please understand before understanding this article. Now what is this article all about? What is the fight? Let's understand. There is a big fight for many years between telecom companies and these apps. A few years back, when we did not have this calling feature on WhatsApp or Skype or Zoom, if you had to, let's say, call someone, if you're in India, you had to call someone in America or you had to call someone in Europe or Australia or whatever. You had to take a proper ISD pack or the call rates were like the ISD, like 25 rupees per minute or 50 rupees per minute in certain cases. That was the ISD. Now what happened all of a sudden, WhatsApp, came in, Skype calling came in, Zoom came in. Now, there would hardly be anyone who would make international calls using their ISE pack. What do you do? You just call using your WhatsApp or these services. The problem here is telecom companies are then losing out on huge revenue. 
they are saying that our revenues are gone now because now you are not making ISD calls. Secondly, the telecom companies are saying the app they are the apps that are working, the services they are providing, WhatsApp or Zoom or Skype, they did not build those optical fiber cables. They did not put on these miles and miles of wires so that internet connectivity can become a reality. Telecom companies say that we are the ones who invested all that money in infrastructure building. We are the ones who put up antennas. We are the ones who made sure that network all around the world has been created. We are the ones who pay millions and millions of rupees to the government in the auction for 4G, 5G, etc. So it is us that is going ahead and bearing all the cost. These apps just are built on top of that and they take all the revenue. You just do a 1 GB recharge and in 1 GB recharge you can keep making your international calls etc. and nothing really will go long, wrong for you. This is why the telecom companies are not happy. Telecom companies are regulated by which authority? Try TRAI. So TRAI recently released a consultation paper about how to regulate these OTT communication services. Means, should they be allowed to give certain services or not? Should they be allowed to eat into the revenue of these telecom operators or not? This is the entire idea. Telecom companies for a long time have been demanding that they want a part of the revenue. For example, if someone uses WhatsApp to make 10 international calls per day, Airtel says, that I want a part of money from WhatsApp because you are eating into my revenue using my data. Just because you did a 1 GB recharge for 250 rupees or whatever, you can't just keep making calls because it is eating into my revenue. That is the entire debate. Obviously, for a consumer point of view, we would not want that. So the fight is between telecom companies and these apps. Telecom companies are regulated by TRAI and this consultation paper has invited certain very sharp reactions from people working in this field about what exactly will be the way forward. Will the telecom companies get some money or a part of the revenue from these apps? I explained to you what the conflict is, that the infrastructure is built by the telecom operators. Money in huge number is spent by the telecom operators. On the other hand, most of the revenue or the easy part of the revenue is being made by these social media apps. And thus the demand is that we should have at least some contribution to be given to these telecom operators from these apps. Because telecom operators, most of them in India, ever since Jio, for example, has come in, has not have not had a very easy time. Look at Idea Vodafone. Going into humongous losses, Government had to invest a lot of money. Vodafone idea had to merge also. It's not a very easy sector to survive. So in such a scenario, they think it is fair that the apps actually give them some help. Now, again, the problem is think of it from the consumer's point of view. We are paying these companies to buy data. If I give 250 rupees to Airtel to buy 1 GB data, now Airtel should not decide what do I do with that data. With that data, I can watch a movie or I can make an international call. Why does Airtel care? That is the entire debate. This is what we call as net neutrality. And we'll just come to that in a bit. This is what we call net neutrality. Net neutrality means internet or the data that you are using, all of that should be considered as equal. Whether you are making an ISD call from that, whether you are using it to watch YouTube or Netflix, whether you are watch, using it to watch me, all of that should be equal. It cannot be the case where Airtel says, oh, for this 200 MB, because you will use it for international calls, I will charge 1000 rupees. For the other 200 MB, you will watch Netflix, okay, only give me 200 rupees for that. For other 200 MB, you will watch YouTube, okay, I will only charge 50 rupees. No, that cannot happen. Net neutrality means, all the network data has to be considered as equal. And this is where we stand right now. But the fear is that maybe, just maybe, this net neutrality may go away ever since this consultation paper has come out. There is a Broadband India forum that has again opposed any ban on the OTT services. 
they say that no we don't want the ott services like whatsapp social media apps etc to be banned what exactly will be the way forward what does the government decide it has to be seen but again the idea of net neutrality became very famous a few years back the debate has started once again can you sell your data pack or data at different rates just by deciding that it will be used differently for different purposes the purpose of how the data will be used should depend on the consumer and not on the company that is selling the data once i have given you money for 2 gb data or 1 gb data or 100 gb data how will i use that data should not be decided by the company let me decide that that is the entire idea i'll give you one more example you would have seen now when you buy a mobile phone a lot of apps are preloaded in the mobile phone there are even ideas or there are even offers that for example if you use youtube you your data consumption will be free meaning that airtel and youtube for example have made a pact youtube says if a person if a consumer consumes 1 gb data on youtube airtel will not count airtel will say okay this is free for you why to push common people to use youtube on the other hand on other apps airtel will count your data let's assume you have whatsapp on your phone and zoom on your phone you have to make a call to somewhere in america do you use zoom or whatsapp let's say you have a airtel sim in your phone airtel has made a pact with whatsapp the pact is if someone uses data on whatsapp airtel will not count that data so your data will also be considered as zero consumption so you'll always obviously use whatsapp and not to zoom this is again a market strategy that many companies apply and this is something that goes against the idea of net neutrality you cannot push a consumer to consume the data in a certain way let the consumer be the decision maker of how and where would they like to consume their data now we move on to some new stories from the prelims examination point of view first one the prime minister has launched the pm vishwakarma scheme vishwakarma scheme as you know specifically is to give a boost to the artists the idea is the government of india will ensure that artists get easy collateral free loans and what is collateral free usually when you go and take a loan for any purpose the bank will ask you for some guarantee in return that is called a collateral meaning that if you are not able to return the loan what will the bank do bank should have some asset of yours so that they can sell and then take the loan back this is called collateral most people don't have that that's why they are rejected or they don't get the loans so government is offering or will offer collateral free loan to the artist to give a boost to them this is called the pm vishwakarma yojana the government of india has allocated 13000 crore rupees to this under this they will equip crafts people with technology and better skills to become a part of the modern market you also know today when you go and buy something which is made by hand which has some aesthetic value it cost you a lot of money in the international market there is a huge demand for artists who make stuff by hand and not by machines and the government wants to explore that market the scheme aims to have better quality products and services especially by traditional artisans they will be given loan first of 1 lakh rupees first tran means first installment kind of a thing it has to be repaid in 18 months if they are able to repay in 18 months then they can be given 2 lakh more that can be repaid in about 30 months they will get it at a very concessional rate of interest that is 5% with a sub interest subvention cap of 8% now what is interest subvention interest subvention means for example bank will give a loan at 12% rate of interest but you only have to pay 5% remaining 7% will be paid by the government <clears throat> this is called interest subvention so government will pay interest on your behalf that's called interest subvention who will pay this it will be paid by ministry of micro small and medium enterprise this is the reason why this money has been allocated so this money that has been allocated to the scheme is mainly to pay the interest subvention the interest that will be in between 
here are some details this scheme was announced a few weeks back now it has been rolled out it talks about the 13000 crore budget there are 18 trades or 18 fields in which the artist will be covered and i'll just give you a list of that as well concession interest rate of 5% for upgrading your skills and having better tools these are those experts that have been included here 18 of them carpenter boat maker armorer blacksmith hammer and tool kit maker locksmith goldsmith potter sculptor cobbler uh, then we have mason basket maker or broom maker doll and toy maker barber garland maker washerman tailor and fishing net maker the government may expand this going forward for now at least these 18 have been included next a news from defense army will induct 114 more dhanush guns by 2026 as you can see in the photo this is what a dhanush gun looks like so there are common handheld guns and then there are artillery guns they move on a vehicle they are used to obviously fire shell at a very very long distance handheld guns obviously those guns can only shoot to a certain extent but these guns can shoot up to multiple kilometers dhanush has always been seen as an alternative to the bofors now the sad part is usually whenever you read the word bofors you have that image of a bofors scandal bofors scam just leave that aside for a bit the reality is bofors has been the mainstay artillery gun of the indian army for a long 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 time it took uh, it played a key role even in the kargil war now that they have become slightly outdated they are being replaced by the dhanush artillery guns apart from this the government is also planning to include more pinaka multi rocket launch systems in the army as soon as possible now dhanush is as i said the artillery gun range is 36 kilometers although it has also demonstrated a range of up to 38 kilometers we have seen how these kind of guns or their versions have been used extremely effectively in the ongoing Ukraine-Russia war. They have been extremely precise and that is why their demand from the army has increased considerably. Then we also have Pinaka rockets. As I said, Pinaka rockets range is also being increased. The government of India is, or the DRDO specifically, is trying to have their range of up till 75 km at least. These decisions of what weapon will be acquired by the military are taken by this body called the Defense Accusation Council, DAC. They are the ones who take this decision of what weapons will be procured at what time and at what price. This is a comparison between the important features of Dhanush artillery gun as compared to Bofors. As I said, Bofors, although it was riddled into the scandal, However, it was extremely effective and did do its job whenever required by the army. Now it is being replaced by Dhanush, which is a much, much better indigenously made artillery gun. Now, Pinaka, on the other hand, I also wanted to give you a bit of detail about that. It's a rocket system. It's a multi-barrel rocket system. Again, it has been developed in India by Pune-based Armament Research and Development Establishment. Also, it's a very, very auspicious name. It's named after Lord Shiva's bow. Pinaka also has proven how successful it can be in the Kargil war. Now, please remember these kind of developments <coughs> are important, not just for our own armed forces. These kind of developments are also important because we want to showcase to the world that you can buy weapons from India. India has been trying to increase its market and its production so that we can exhibit that you can come and buy affordable and effective weapons from India. That's a very impressive way of increasing your overall export. A case in point, I don't know how many of you have noticed, a case in point is South Korea. Without a lot of people realizing in the past decade or so, South Korea has become a huge weapon manufacturer and exporter. In fact, Recently, when India was trying to sell Tejas, that is our fighter craft, to other countries, it was competing against South Korea's aircraft. 
Egypt, for example, wanted to buy some aircrafts. They were finalizing it. At in the final round of negotiation, Egypt had to decide between India's stages and South Korea, and they went ahead with the South Korean aircraft. South Korea has even exported hundreds of tanks recently to Poland when the Ukraine-Russia war is going on. So again, it shows how countries are focusing on putting a lot more money into research of their weapon system, the defense system, so that they can use it as an export. And South Korea is doing that. India also is trying to do the same. Because again, it makes you self-reliant and it also makes sure that you can earn a lot of foreign exchange because of this. Because think of the thing from the point of view of slightly poorer African or Asian nations. They can't afford to buy these top-of-the-line expensive weapons from Russia, Israel or America that we do. For them, they need much more affordable weapon system. And this is where countries such as India come into the picture for their help. This Pinaka can fire 12 rockets over a period of 44 seconds. It has been developed again by DRDO and has been successfully tested in various other versions. The Mac 2 version has also been tested. It has a guided range of about 75 kilometers and a navigation system to go with it. Also, the navigation system of this missile is also aided by the IRNSS. As you know, this is India's version or India's alternate to the GPS. This is India's own regional navigation system using which we can actually guide our own weapon system and be self-reliant and not be relied on any other country. The next news story is Shanti Niketan that has now become a part of UNESCO World Heritage List. Now, this is a news that we discussed a few weeks back also, if you remember. It has come in the picture once again because now official announcement has been made. It has officially been inducted into this list of UNESCO World Heritage. Now, this was a house built by Rabindranath Tagore's father. It is owned by the Tagore family. It has been a chain or it, its form has changed multiple times. It has been converted into school, college. There are multiple classes that have been run over the years at this place. It's considered a small town in West Bengal's Birbham district. And also, Shanti Niketan as a word means the abode of peace. It was created or it was built in 1901. How does this get a place in the UNESCO World Heritage List? It is due to the efforts of the Ministry of Culture from the side of the Government of India. It has been described as a place that exhibits an important interchange in human values over a span of time within cultural areas of the world. Also, there have been multiple attempts made from the side of the Indian Government to get Shanti Niketan listed in the UNESCO World Heritage List, efforts have been on since 2010. The Archaeological Survey of India has been trying to revive multiple other cultural heritages of India along with this Shanti Niketan as well. It is owned by the Tagore family as I said. The story goes like Ravinna Tagore's father, Devinna Tagore. When he was going on a boat ride, he spotted this piece of land where he thought it would be a great place to build a house which can be used for meditation. It's amongst all this peaceful nature. That is how the story of Shanti Niketan began. It was in 1901 that Avinna Tagore chose a wise or chose a tract of land and started a school also over here called Brahmachari Ashram. It was based on India's own Gurukul system. It was renamed as a university or it was upgraded to a university called as the Vishwa Bharati University. I'll tell you a very interesting or let me give you an interesting homework. You might be surprised to know this. Search or if you know this, do let me know in the comment section who acts as a chancellor of the Vishwa Bharati University. Okay, the question is very simple. Who acts as a chancellor of the Vishwa Bharati University? If you know this, great. You can tell me in the comment section later on. If you don't know this, search for this and you might be surprised to know the answer. Because this person does not act as a chancellor of any other university. This is the only one, the Vishwa Bharati one. Anyways, the UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is 
usually how the world heritage sites are chosen these are the other details that you need to know selection criteria basically includes that they should be classified as landmarks they should be unique physically including ancient ruins cities etc also remember india is not a member of the world heritage committee so it makes the job even tougher also the world heritage committee as such has 21 state parties elected for a four year term they manage something called the world heritage fund that also gives financial assistance for the upkeep of all these places selected to be a part of this list the last topic for today is from africa military leaders of three nations mali niger and burkina faso have come together to sign a mutual defense pact so basically if you have realized this in africa the sahel region specifically we have seen how there has been a wave of military overthrowing their own elected government now in order to ensure that their interests are aligned the military leaders of these three countries have decided that we will come together if there is any outside threat we will help each other and we'll make sure that our own interests are protected these three countries remember are mali burkina faso and niger there is an area which is made up of these three countries that area is called liptako gorma i'll just show you down map so this area the shaded one this area is called liptako gorma region it is made up of three countries niger mali and burkina faso do remember this name these kind of questions are very very common in the prelims examination do remember the name of this area and the three countries that make it up together the group that they have formed is called the alliance of the sahel states the idea is simple that we will help each other we will ensure that our militaries are not overthrown or attacked by anyone from the outside or within our country these three countries have undergone coups since 2020 and the military now wants to make sure that their power remains intact this is how the region looks like as expected it is also one of the poorest regions in the entire world which has food insecurity which does not have any development most people in this area have not even got their covid-19 vaccine and now to make the situation even worse we have the military rule coming back once again This brings us to the end of today's discussion. Here are a couple of practice questions that you can try and write answers to. First question is from Project Cheetah. While the second question is this quote, and this quote is by our ex president of India, Shri Pradeepa Patil. So Shri Madhi Pradeepa Patil had made this quote. From here to here, Parliament of the country is a repository of the sovereign will of the people. and its successful functioning is a joint responsibility of both the government and the opposition try and write these answers as you know we have a student answer writing portal where you can go and put your answers you can see each other's answers as well give feedback to each other to learn from each other's mistakes i'll see you tomorrow 10 am for the next session of the hindu news of analysis have a good day ahead bye bye jai hind